Okay, Psalms 22. So has there ever been a time in your life that you felt very discouraged? Felt very alone? You may even were struggling with depression. A time in your life maybe where it seemed like no matter what you try to do, things seem like they just get harder and more difficult. Um, the passage we're going to look at this morning is David, and he's dealing with that. We don't sometimes think about David having struggles um, because in the Bible it talks about David being a man after God's own heart. And, and if there's anybody that was closer to God in a roundabout way, probably even more so than Moses in the Old Testament, it was David. David had his problems. We know he sinned with Bathsheba. And as David is writing this psalm, this is most likely was probably taking place in the time of his life when he was running for his life from his son. That his son was trying to kill him, trying to take the throne from him. And so David, at this time, as he's writing this, you can imagine the family dynamic of the problem he's going through right now. And maybe you're this morning, you're dealing with that yourself. As we look at this, I'm going to also bring in, as we see this passage, is a passage which we call a Messianic Psalm that deals with Jesus Christ also. And in a lot of these psalms, you probably recognize some of the verses that I get ready to read it here that, that you've heard referring to Jesus Christ yourself. And so Jesus knows what you're going through. So I'd like to start in verse 1 of Psalm chapter 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groanings, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear and in the night season, and I am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried, and you were, you were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head, saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue himself. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while my mother on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me, strong bulls of Bashan, have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bo bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for the dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed on me. They pierce me, my hands and my feet. And I count all my bones, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. We'll stop there, we'll look at the rest of the psalm, but the, the first 18 verses really give us a picture of what David's going through, but some of you, your Bibles probably have a lot of the pronouns in here capitalized because it's also reference to Jesus Christ. And so we have this situation here where David is probably running for his life, if this is correct. He's hiding from his son who wants to kill him, to take the throne from him. All of us, we sometimes have family problems. I don't know any family that hasn't gone through it. Most of us, though, our family, they may say like they want to kill us, but they don't really want to kill us. In most cases. Not always, but most cases. Here, David's son wants his life taken from him. David's son is doing everything he can to have his father killed. That is the only way he will become king. He wants to be the king of Israel, and David's in his way. And so he's going to try to kill David. And so as David is running, he doesn't know who to trust. His son has influenced so much of his special guard and the people close to him. They are following his son instead of him. He doesn't know who he can be in close contact with, who he can talk to. He is scared for his life. 
And he's also scared for the kingdom of Israel. And so David, as he's running, some words in here he talks about that, that he says, My God, my God. And we know that's reference to Jesus Christ also on the cross. Why hast thou forsaken me? David in his life at this point feels like he's completely alone. He feels like he's completely isolated. He feels like everyone he knows is against him. Maybe you have felt like that sometime in your life in the past. Maybe you're going through that right now in your life. You feel like there is no one who I can trust. There's no one who is close to me. I feel all alone. David obviously wasn't all alone. He had God. But he didn't have God in a roundabout way like we do, living in his heart. If there was anybody who had in the Old Testament what we experienced in the New Testament, it would have been David. But I don't think David had the exact same experience we have with the Holy Spirit living in our heart. But it talks about the Spirit of God comes upon David, the Spirit of God stays with David, even through all his problems and struggles, just like God's Holy Spirit stays with us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. Amen. But here, David feels like he has no reason to keep living. He feels like life is hopeless. He is in a dark place. Maybe you feel that way today yourself. Or you have been that way and God has brought you out of it. There's always a way out. Our family has experienced what happens when someone ends their life early. It makes it hard for everybody else left behind. There's always a way out. And so here David feels like he has no hope. He feels like there's no way out. And he says he's crying out to God. And, and maybe you've been here like David is. Maybe you had time that you've prayed with God and it feels like God does not hear you. If I ask you to raise your hand, I think all of us would raise our hand up at one time or another in our life when we were praying about something that seemed like God wasn't hearing us. That's where David's at. He's praying and he wants God to hear him. And it sounds like his, his prayers, if he's in a cave, if he's out in the woods, wherever he's at, his prayers aren't going any further than him off his lips. He doesn't believe God is hearing him. He doesn't believe God is responding to his prayers. He is so discouraged. And David, he tries to remind himself, and he will throughout this song, about God's love and God's care and how God has taken care of his people. And when you face those times of despair, when you face those times of, of, of wanting to give up or lose hope, grab a hold of God's Word, especially portions of it that has spoken to you, that has encouraged you, that has uplifted you in the past. God wants to use them as a reminder for you now, in the present, and in the future. And so David, he, he remembers God's promise to the children of Israel, how God promised to give them the land, how God promised that they would follow him, that he would protect them, he would take care of them. And David is trying to remind himself, even in this time of prayer, that God still cares, even though he doesn't feel like it. And you might be that way. Maybe you don't feel like God cares about you. Well, God cares about such and such. He answers their prayers. He's taking care of them. He doesn't care about me. Maybe you feel that way. But God still cares. God still cares. And so David, as he's reminding himself in his roundabout prayer, he also talks about how he feels like at this point in his life that he's nothing more than a worm. A creature that really seems as very little purpose in life. Even though those of you who are farmers know they play a great purpose. But he says it feels like a worm. And especially when he thinks about his relationship between him and God. God is so big. God is so mighty. God is beyond his understanding. And he's this little tiny worm that just crawls along that can die at any moment. And in a roundabout way, he almost kind of seems like in this prayer, as he, in this song, he just wants someone to step on him and squish him and get life over with. Because life is just so painful. He wants to be done with it. And so as he's praying this, he, again, these passages go to Jesus Christ. And, and it tells us about Jesus. He was on that cross. He was alone, wasn't he? He was despised. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. And even this verse here, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He quotes why he was on the cross about to die. Jesus knows what it's like to go through loneliness. 
Jesus knows what it's like to go through pain in life. It's hard and difficult. He understands what you're going through. That's how he's able to relate to us. That's how he can say that he knows what we're dealing with and he can encourage us. And, and, and then as David continues writing, he talks about how the people are mocking him and ridiculing him and laughing at him. You can imagine as he's the king of Israel, he's on the run from his son. He's not in the palace. He's not on his kingly throne. He probably doesn't even have his kingly robe and crown with him at this point. He is probably just running around almost like peasants' clothes trying to hide from everyone and anyone. And he says, they're mocking me, they're ridiculing me, they're belittling me. Did Jesus get mocked and ridiculed? Yeah. He got teased. He got laughed at. He got bullied. He knows what life is like that we go through. He knows like when people have said evil things about us, even when we try to do something good. And so here David is, he's crying out, he says, that they tried to hurt me. And he says at the point that they shoot out the lip. And, and this word here, in a lot of ways, it could be kind of like gossip in our day, or slander, or speaking evil about someone. He says, they're speaking evil about me. He's the king of Israel. He's the man after God's own heart. And people are speaking evil about him. Again, that pictures us Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. And, and, and all the evil people said about him, the lies they told about him, the mockery they had done. And, and, and he goes back and, and he, he reminds himself in his prayer that he's got to trust God. That's what it all comes down to. We have to have trust in God. <laughs> We've got to have faith that God knows what's going on. God knows what he's doing, even if it doesn't seem right to us. Because God doesn't make mistakes. You say, well, he made a mistake with me because every now and then I go, no, he doesn't make mistakes. God knows what is best always. It may not be what we think is best, but he knows what is best. And so David, as he's continuing his prayer, he, he talks about how he had faith in God from his mother's womb. Again, this, wherever he actually started believing in God, we don't know. It's just a reference that he, his whole life, from the time he knew he could trust in God, he was trusting in God. Right? We know the stories of David, right? That's what we tell kids in Sunday school class, and we tell kids in, in, in get-togethers. David fought lion, David fought a bear, and David fought the giant man, Goliath. Had faith, he had trust even as a young boy. And that faith and trust continued through his adult years. And now he finds himself where he is shaking in his faith, he's shaking in his trust. He is having a tough time having trust and, and, and belief that God knows what is best, but he's trying to remind himself to trust God. Even if the outcome, the worst it can be, is we die, as believers, to be honest, that's the best. It's hard sometimes for us to think about that, but if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, when we die, where do we go? To heaven. A whole lot better than here. Perfect everything. No more sorrow, no more grief, no more tears, no more loneliness, no more sadness, no more unfaith or trust in God. It will be perfect paradise. And so even if we die here, as believers, we have the best still waiting for us to come. Um, one of the older ladies in West Virginia where I grew up, and you guys probably heard something like this, she always just say, Keep your fork after the main meal was done. Because you always say, the best is still yet to come. And she used that a lot. And I still remember that. One of the, uh, the ladies who helped out with a lot of the dinners and stuff in West Virginia. And she always would say, keep your fork because the best is still yet to come. That also is in life for us in general. The best is still waiting for us. If we can try to picture what we think the best life on earth is. And it is just a drop in the bucket compared to what God has waiting for us when we get to heaven. 
And so David's reminding himself of his faith in God, reminding himself that he needs to believe God because God knows what's going on. And he, he talks about that, that he is so surrounded, and he uses this term that he's encircled by bulls. And these aren't mild bulls. These aren't tame bulls. These are dangerous wild bulls and thorns. He says they're circling around him looking for an opportunity to charge at any moment. And the reference is to the people who are wanting to kill him. It's hard to believe that a king of Israel, who is a man after God's own heart, that people wanted to kill him. Much less his own family. And David says, I feel like there's no hope. He feels like no matter which way he goes, there's going to be a bull he's going to have to face. That life itself is just going to be painful and dangerous and deadly. And he says that they're gaping their mouths up. And in reference to these bulls, like the mouth hanging and the tongue hanging, he references the people, again, mocking him, making fun of him, teasing him, ridiculing him. Their mouth is gaping open. Kind of like the Roman soldiers did with Jesus. And they mocked him and they beat him. They slammed the crown of thorns on his head. They, they whipped him. They threw a robe on him and they teased him. And so did the Pharisees, right? When he first was arrested, they, they, they were slapping him and saying, tell us who hit you if you are the Son of God. And so David's reference here again pictures Jesus Christ, and he says they're like a raging, roaring lion, ready to seek whom they can devour, ready to just tear him apart. They almost did that to Jesus, didn't they? I mean, he was to the point that he was almost torn apart. The whips would be almost kind of like claws of a lion ripping on his back. And David says that he was poured out like water. His bones felt like out of joint. He hurt all over. When you're dealing with really major loneliness or depression and, and, and struggles, it affects your whole body. You don't even feel like getting out of bed because it just doesn't feel good. And here David is saying that, that he, he, he feels like his whole body's pulled out of joint. But again, this is a reference to Jesus Christ. And we're, and we're told by those who have studied and, and, and analyzed the human body, especially when it came to the crucifixion, when the, when the cross dropped down, it said the bodies were pulled out of joint. And this is a reference probably to Jesus Christ as he has his body most likely pulled out of joint when the cross thudded as they dropped it into the ground. He said his strength has dried up. And he's talking about being so thirsty, so basically worn out that his mouth is so dry that his tongue is sticking to the roof of his mouth. This is how depressed David is. This is how scared David is and the anxiety he is facing. And he says that his tongue is sticking to his mouth. His tongue clings to his jaws. And he says, you have brought me, God, you have brought me to this place. You have brought me to the place where death almost in some ways is better than what life is right now. He was very depressed. He was very discouraged. And David, as he continues praying to God and talking to God through the rest of the Psalms, he brings out how... God's responsibilities, again, are to his people and to taking care of David and those who love him. And So David comes to the place where he, as he asks for, he's done praying and reminding God about this covenant love. Again, as we think about communion, Jesus says this is a new covenant. This is the new relationship I have with those who are my believers. That the bread represents my body that's broken for you. The cup represents my blood that will be shed for you. And he says, as you remember this new covenant, as we partake of communion here in a little bit, he says, every time you take it, you remember me. And so David's reminding God, and even though God doesn't be reminded, he's, in a roundabout way, he's also reminding himself about this covenant promise of God that God will always have the children of Israel around. No matter how difficult life might get, God promises that Israel still has a place in his heart. 
just as you do, no matter how difficult it might get. God cares for you. Again, how much did Jesus care? We always talk about he held his arms out. shows how much he cared. How much did the Father care? He gave something that none of us would really give, their own son, on the behalf of someone who's a sinner. God cares for you. Again, David is utterly hopeless. He is depressed. He is in a dire situation, and he knows the only help he can get, the only one who can provide comfort and peace, is God. That's who he has to trust in. That's who he has to rely on. That's who he has to put his faith in. And so David goes and he publicly praises God. He thanks God for all that he's doing, even though David had challenges ahead of him. He had challenges ahead of him. He's not even in the throne room right now. He's not even in the palace. He's not even in Jerusalem, most likely. He's outside the city. And if he's going to become king, he's got to get back in that place where he's in charge. But to do that means he has to take care of something. And something he really doesn't want to have to deal with is his son. His son who wants to kill him. His son who wants to take his place on the kingdom. David has to face that. That'd be a tough decision to have to make, wouldn't it? A family member of yours who you truly love, you care about, especially if it's a child or a grandchild, a niece or nephew, and, and you've poured your life into them and all they want to do is try to kill you. But you have to do something because otherwise you're going to destroy the whole nation of Israel. It'd be a tough decision to have to make. And so David praises God for his love. He praises God that he'll walk with him. He'll never leave him. He'll, he'll be with him through his challenges just as Jesus faced his problem. You know, Jesus, when he was praying, even though he had the disciples with him, and maybe you've experienced this yourself, something's been so heavy on your heart you can't sleep and that you're praying. And even though you have friends or you have family members you ask to pray for you, they're not up all night like you are praying about it. Even though it's very, very important to you, it's just not the same. And here David is Lacking sleep. Jesus lacked sleep because of the anguish he was facing, the, the difficulty that lied ahead of him. Even before he was arrested, he spent the night praying, knowing what was coming. And he even prayed and says, Father, if it is possible, if there's any way around this, let this cup pass me. And that cup you're referring to is the painful death he's about ready to start going through. The mocking, the ridiculing, the, the loneliness, the despair. And then ultimately the painful death of the cross. And he says, Father, but if not, your will be done, not mine. I'm glad Jesus did the Father's will instead of wanting to pass away from not having to take the cross. Because if he didn't go to the cross, we wouldn't have salvation today. If he didn't go to the cross, we wouldn't have eternal life and hope of one day being in heaven with God forever. And so as we get ready to close up here, much of this psalm, again, is a Messianic psalm. It means that it's referencing to Jesus Christ. Many parts of it, Jesus it, it, it went through and experienced that night that he was betrayed, that night that he was beaten and ridiculed, that day he hung on the cross until he ultimately died. He died because of my sin. He died because of your sin. And he promises all who believe in him in his death, his burial, and resurrection, he promises to give them eternal life. And so maybe you're here this morning, if you want to stay around after church and we pray with you or find someone else to pray with, we'd be more glad to do so. If you're really going through a hardship, reach out. Reach out to God, reach out to your friends, your family, and ask God to strengthen your faith. Ask God to help your resolve as you're facing these trials and these struggles, because you do not have to go through it alone. You may feel like you do, but you don't. Even if no one else here is wanting to be there with you, which I don't believe that is true, I think just about everybody here would, would be willing to pray with you if you asked them to. But even if no one else here cared about you, God does. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He promises to always be with you. So let's close in prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time as we come together to observe communion, to remember your death, your burial, and your resurrection.
and the promises of heaven that await for all of us one day when we get there, if we know you as our Savior. I pray, Lord, that your word would speak to hearts this morning. I pray for those who are really going through some very difficult struggles, that you would encourage them with your word today, that your Holy Spirit would speak to their spirit, and you would guide them, Father, and help them to find a family member or a friend or someone else in the church to pray with them, Father, to encourage them, and help them to realize that you always love them, you always care for them. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, the wafer represents the body of Christ. And it says in, in the Bible, both in the Gospels and also in Corinthians, that as Paul is writing to remind the church that, that communion has a special meaning, a special purpose. It reminds us of our relationship with God, which this psalm also reminds us of. It reminds us of our relationship with each other. And so this bread, Jesus says, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. Before we partake, I'd like to ask Keith to pray for the bread, if you would, if you can. Your hands aren't too full with your kids. You can turn it on. A little switch on right on top of it. Lord, uh, we just want to come to you now and remember that uh, why we're here, Lord. We just pray that uh, you remember the sacrifice, the, the bones that were broken, and the blood that was shed, that we could be here today. And our only reason for you is to pray that uh, we remember you and don't forget. And you, and Jesus said that as he broke the bread, and he said, take this bread, it reminds you of my body, which is broken for you. As often as you take this and eat it, you remember my death. And then Jesus, after he did with the bread, he, he did the same with the cup. He told the disciples as he was there that the cup represents his blood that was going to be spilled and that it was going to be shed and that it was going to pay for the sins and the death of, of all. And, and so Jesus, that same night as he took the cup, and then before we partake of the cup, um, Chuck, you want to pray for the cup, please? Father, we uh, thank you, Father, for your great love and for your wonderful plan of salvation, dear Lord. And we pray, Father, this cup might help us remember the blood of thy Son and the great sacrifice made for each of us, dear Lord. Father, your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace are more than what we can ever imagine, dear Lord. We so bless and we thank you, Father, for our Lord and making a sacrifice for us, dear Lord. This is the holy name. Amen. 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 And Jesus said that same night as he took the cup, he said, This cup represents my blood, which is shed for you. As often as you take this, you do so in remembrance of me. Let's pray. 